Dearest Anna, I hope this letter finds you and the boys well. Our momentum here on the front has stalled again, and morale has plummeted among the men. The captain said we'd be home by Christmas, though he failed to specify which Christmas. Allied armor has finally arrived, but I fear it's too late to break this terrible impasse. Not one tree remains standing, and the battlefield now bears more resemblance to a desert than the lush wood we occupied a month ago. Rations have become scarce, and some of the men have taken to sneaking over the top at night to scavenge her scraps. The Rostorians seem well fed enough. The prisoners we take have healthy bodies and clean uniforms, their pockets laden with additional supplies and ammunition. I can't imagine why they continue to hide behind that relentless bombardment, though it sounds like the barrage is lifting? Hey what's going on guys, Skit Gaming here, and today I'm going to be reviewing a game whose career I've watched with great interest. That game is Trenches Alpha by Ordnance Games. I discovered Trenches back in June under the name of Frontline Alpha and played it a bit with Onyx. Even then, the game had some innovative mechanics that I've never seen before, and I reached out to the creator in July asking for some information so I could make a proper review. Haruna told me that the game was still very early in development and not ready for mainstream attention, so I let it grow for a few months, and now that I'm getting actual requests for it, I can't put this review off any longer. Sorry Haruna, you should have replied to my inquiry. Now that we've talked about my non-sponsored relationship with this game, let's get into the meat and potatoes of Trenches. What's it about? How is it played? Is it worth my time? All these questions and more will be answered in today's Skit Mega Review. So let's talk setting. Trenches takes place during an alternate World War I-esque conflict. Four nations fight each other for control in three different environments. First off is Restora, who you can't say for sure is based off of a certain European country, but come on. Look at them. These guys blend in with exactly zero of the environments they fight in, and serve as a great way to test if your rifle is sighted in. Next up is their ally, Adu Sasha, who most likely hails from some region of Africa. When they're not wearing helmets, these soldiers like to sport tiny cylindrical hats that don't even fit on their heads. I don't know what it's supposed to be, but all the Google results show people with normal sized hats. So, why do they wear these? Bam, 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 bam. Option 3, naturally, is the afro, which makes you appear larger and more intimidating to potential threats. On the other side of the war, we have Ascovia, which has been Restora's sworn enemy since the beginning. The Ascovians understand that there is more green in nature than grey, but forget that Africa has a notable lack of vegetation. I think that they're supposed to be Russian based just on the name, but I've got no idea past that. Finally, the Ascovians are supported by none other than the Smurfs in the form of Noxuya. Apparently Papa Smurf broke his policy of isolationism and ended up getting dragged into the war. Now Restora is trying to fight their way through the dense, foggy forests of the Noxu, who blend in extremely well with the marshes of their homeland. I think that even though they're filthy non-humans, these guys are still my favorite. Hold it right there, the game was updated while I was editing and a new nation has been thrown into the mix, Vos Dor, based out of the snowy tundra is an entirely composed of cat people. I now have a new least favorite faction, and the fact that these guys get bodied by the Noxu makes me like them even more. Anyway, back to your scheduled programming. These factions duke it out around the world using 20th century firearms and primitive machines fueled by good old industrialization and a pinch of magic. The objective of the game is to control all six flags on the map. In order to do this, a player needs to get close to an opposing flag and change its color. If this action isn't reversed within three minutes, the flag will be captured and a new flag will spawn closer to the enemy. As days pass, new technology like weapons, vehicles, and structures will be unlocked to break the stalemate. Days are 12 minutes long and nights are around 7, and since the only limit is the storage space on the server, battles can last for hours on end as ground is taken and lost in a brutal tug of war. I don't have to explain to you what the infantry is. These foot soldiers make up the bulk of every army and see the most frontline action, boldly holding the lines and taking the fight to the enemy. The OG Vanilla Rifleman is the most common soldier you see on the battlefield. He is unlocked on day one and is completely free to use. Equipped with a rifle, melee weapon, grenade, and construction equipment, this versatile class can act as cheap cannon fodder while also being able to function as a sniper, anti-armor, or pseudo-engineer. 
The rifle itself is a bolt action that holds 6 rounds, and like every gun in the game, it kills in 3 shots to the body or 2 to the head. Even though it's probably the worst firearm, I don't really mind having to use it. Unlocked on day 2, the Grenadier is nearly identical to the Rifleman, except instead of one grenade with a max capacity of 2, he spawns with a full loadout of 4 grenades. Because of this, the Grenadier costs 50 points to spawn as. I find that grenades serve better as anti-armor and sabotage devices than anti-personnel, so the Grenadier really shines for me as a cheap way to kill tanks and the perfect infiltrator to slip behind enemy lines at night and destroy pillboxes and artillery emplacements. The light machine gunner is unlocked on day 3 and spawns with a portable automatic weapon. This gun has a 24 round capacity and is best used for mowing down troops in the open or for laying down suppressing fire. The LMG costs a whopping 250 points to spawn, the equivalent of 5 grenadiers, so make sure not to take any unnecessary risks as this guy. The carbine, yes, I pronounce it carbine, crucify me, is a semi-automatic rifle with a 10 round capacity. At 50 points, it's a rather tempting investment and one of my personal favorites. The only issue is that the carbine is unlocked on day 5, and the battle is usually resolved before then. The final infantry class is the submachine gunner. The SMG has a 20 round capacity and a higher fire rate than its larger brother, the LMG. It's also cheaper, coming in at 200 points. The only gripe I have with this weapon is that it's difficult to control at longer ranges, so I would recommend keeping to the close combat of the trenches if you plan on using it. It unlocks on day 6 with the rest of the endgame units, and is therefore the most rare small arm on the battlefield. Next up we have the Specialists, who are also dismounted, but fill more niche roles in a way that regular infantry can't. The Engineer is unlocked from the very beginning and costs 100 points to spawn as. Engineers come equipped with a 6 round pistol and have the unique ability to build special structures like artillery, pillboxes, and more. They also build and demolish structures twice as fast as everybody else. Be careful not to expose yourself for too long when building, because the distinctive Engineer armband and stationary figure make you an enticing target for snipers. The Medic is also available on day 1, but doesn't cost any points to use. Once again, it's nearly identical to the Rifleman, except instead of a grenade you receive a first aid kit. This can be used to instantly heal any wounded ally to full health, and I feel like the Medic is greatly underutilized by players. Finally, we have the Anti-Tank Gun. This class gets a magic-powered cannon that charges up and fires a beam of energy that explodes on impact. The obvious application is to destroy armored vehicles, but this device can also be used to soften up fortifications and kill personnel, although the latter use is probably classified as a war crime. This class costs 100 points and gets unlocked on Day 5. I find that ATGs are at a significant disadvantage against infantry, and also paint an enormous target on their heads with the large, glowing magic rings that allow their weapon to function. As the name of the game would suggest, a large part of trenches is building structures to give your team an advantage. Whether you're planting landmines, deploying barbed wire, or erecting bridges, good structure placement can easily be the difference between victory and defeat. The basic trench is a universal sight on the battlefield. No matter if you're in the thick of the action or the fringes of the map, chances are that you'll find these things strewn about. The trench is a primarily defensive structure that protects infantry from small arms fire and presents a hazard to tanks. These can be chained together to make safer routes through no man's land. The foxhole is basically a round, more spacious trench that can be attached to any existing networks. I believe that its intended purpose is to act as a junction so that trench lines can make sharper turns than normal, though I usually see these deployed on their own. Everyone knows what barbed wire is. In this game, it slows players down to a crawl so that they can be picked off by opportunistic snipers. Barbed wire is the most misused structure in the game. Duckboards are small, simple bridges that can be used to traverse trenches and watery areas. They're easy to build and easy to destroy, so don't be afraid to slap a few of these down if it'll help you get somewhere. Sandbags are an above ground obstacle that, when fully built, give players a little peephole to snipe through. I often see sandbags used to protect artillery pieces and pillboxes. Tank traps are unlocked on day 5. If you've ever seen Saving Private Ryan, you'll remember these from the Omaha beach scene. Also known as Czech Hedgehogs, these obstacles are built to funnel tanks and other armored vehicles into kill traps and generally control avenues of approach. Landmines are also unlocked on Day 5. Turn a once beautiful stretch of woods into a Bosnian hellscape with these handy little traps. They're only visible to enemies within a few studs, so they're difficult to locate and disarm. 
The rest of these constructs can only be built, upgraded, and repaired by engineers. Starting with the dugout, which is a hardened bunker that protects you from artillery fire. Personally, I think that these are a huge waste of time, because if you're not pushing forward and not shooting at the enemy, w what are you even doing? The grenade box is a box full of grenades. Who'd have thunk it? Players can stock up on handheld explosive fun on their way to the battlefront for maximum carnage. Field artillery has long since been known as the king of the battlefield, and this moniker definitely holds true in trenches. The moment it's unlocked on day two, engineers are scrambling to build it for their team because whoever has superior artillery will surely dominate the field. Just make sure not to let any pesky foes get close, because artillery pieces are deathly allergic to grenades. Finally, we have the gun nest. Unlocked alongside artillery on day two, these wooden boxes function as AI turrets that will target and fire at any enemies in a line of sight. The longer it shoots at someone, the more accurate it becomes. Gun nests can be upgraded into concrete pillboxes, which have a much higher rate of fire and can single-handedly hold down open areas of the battlefield. The merits of the gun nest are hotly debated because they can easily be taken out by enemy armor or artillery. Last but not least, Trenches offers an assortment of armored vehicles to smash through defenses and mow down soft, squishy infantry. The land ship is unlocked on day 4 and costs 2,000 points to spawn. That's the equivalent of 40 carbines. Featuring two AI machine guns and a turreted cannon with coaxial machine gun, the land ship has decided more battles than any other unit in the game. Since anti-tank guns aren't unlocked until day 5, Landships are free to wreak havoc for a while, with only hand grenades and artillery to oppose them. Every other tank is unlocked on Day 6, and premier among them is the Behemoth. The Behemoth is an upgraded landship with better armor that sports an overwhelming 5 AI machine guns, in addition to the traditional turret cannon with accompanying machine gun. The Behemoth is rather slow and presents a large target for artillery shells, but soaks up damage all the same. Next up we've got the medium tank, which functions as a fast moving support vehicle. It comes equipped with one forward facing AI machine gun and the usual player controlled turret configuration. The medium tank trades armor and weaponry for speed and a low cost. It might seem counterintuitive, but I tend to use these more aggressively than the heavier tanks, usually with a specific target in mind. The gun carrier is essentially a self propelled artillery piece that can drive around to give you the best position to fire from. Unlike their boring stationary cousins, these can still use the top-down targeting view during nighttime and let you direct effective fire when normal defenses don't cut it. The gun carrier is definitely intended for use in a support role, given its fragile nature, total lack of defenses, and exposed driver's seat. Last and most likely least, we have the troop carrier. This funny looking vehicle is intended to ferry players safely to the front line, but it's slow, clumsy, and fragile. It has one forward-facing AI machine gun and usually lasts all of 60 seconds in a pitched battle. I don't know why they hold on to it until day 6, like it's some sort of end-all, end-game technology. It's just a box on treads and nobody uses it anyway. I like that list of small pros and cons that I did for the Bleeding Blades review, so I'm gonna bring it back for this one as well. First, the little things I like. The premise of the game is simple and uncomplicated by any alternate objectives or goals. You just gotta push up and take flags, that's it. All strategies and actions are based around accomplishing this sole mission. The art style is unique and simplistic, relying on Roblox's own material textures. You don't need to see individual spikes to know that this is barbed wire. This basic presentation helps focus the experience on the actual combat. Player cosmetics are randomly assigned. You can spawn with a helmet, patrol cap, or sometimes just hair. Your backpack can range from a generic bag, to comms equipment, to a water tank, to my personal favorite, cooking supplies. Gender is also randomly assigned, which some people have a problem with, but hey, it could be worse. You used to spawn as cat girls. There aren't any crosshairs to indicate where you're aiming, and you have to rely on your weapon's iron sights to be accurate. Not only does this give each gun a bit more character, but it also factors into a player's choice of weapon. Personally, I like the standard rifle sights the best. The setting of a fantastical world gripped by a great war-like conflict is unique and doesn't take away from the gameplay. If you removed all the magic and replaced it with conventional technology, the mechanics of the game would stay the exact same. The ability to terraform the terrain anywhere you want to is something that I've never seen done before in a Roblox game. Digging trenches into the earth and connecting them to form seamless networks is incredibly advanced as far as popular games on this platform go, and I really hope that other creators see the potential in this concept. 
The day-night cycle helps to keep the game from getting too monotonous by not only altering the scenery, but also changing the effectiveness of various technologies to allow for tactics that wouldn't be possible in the daytime. The terrain is randomly generated, so each battle is unique. The different biomes retain certain characteristics. The African maps always feature sparse vegetation and large, indestructible stone pillars. The forest maps are full of trees and rocks. And the umbral maps have dense foliage, thick fog, and bodies of water. The scoreboard is easy to read and understand. The ragdolls are decent and it's fun to see them be thrown around by explosions. Maybe this feature is standard nowadays and I've just been tainted by Blood and Iron's subpar ragdolls, but I appreciate it nonetheless. They reinstated private servers so you can host organized battles. Now for some things that I didn't like so much. The melee combat system is pretty janky. The actual hit doesn't sync up with the animation and the hit detection can seem a bit iffy. The tanks can be somewhat frustrating to use. You can't traverse while moving, which makes sense, but that gets really annoying when the tank chokes and dies trying to climb a hill. They also frequently get stuck in trenches, which I'm pretty sure is a feature, but it happens way too often. I think it'd be cool if larger tanks like the Behemoth could just drive over trenches, while smaller tanks like the Medium Tank would have to build a bridge or go around them. Another thing with tanks, allied players like to try to ride on top of them, which causes the tank to twitch and jerk all over the place and prevents you from aiming the gun. Grenades are nearly worthless in an anti-personnel capacity. As long as the enemy's on a different Y level, or at least 6 feet away, the grenade's not gonna do anything. This problem's been mitigated over the past couple months, but framerate issues still manifest sometimes when there's a lot of explosions happening, especially in the late game when a lot of stuff's been built and tanks are all over the place. This game can drag on and on sometimes. If a battle isn't resolved within the first four days, the chances it will deteriorate into an endless stalemate go up dramatically. One time I started a battle on the Noxuya map, and it ended up taking 17 game days and thousands of deaths to win. Each player gets a passive point income, which is great, but that's the only way to get points without buying more or having a friend join the game. I think that you should at least get points for kills or capturing flags to help move things along and motivate people. There's no way to keep track of your stats, so you never know how you're actually performing. This could be fixed with a leaderboard each round, or just another bubble at the top of the screen. Speaking of stats and bubbles, please swap the death counter around, it's starting to get on my nerves. There's a bug where people spawn with no clothes on, and these naked warriors are immune to bullets and can only use their melee and building tools. If they're giving you a hard time, just clobber them with your melee, they'll go down just as easy as anyone else. All in all, I think that Trenches is a fun game that has a lot of potential, especially once it starts getting bigger as more people play it. I can also see organized groups battling here in a way not dissimilar to games like Waterloo. The game also has an active player base and receives frequent updates. In its current state, I will give Trenches Alpha a crisp 7 out of 10. What's going on guys, Editing Skid here. If you couldn't tell from the month-long drought of content, I've been very busy for the last couple weeks. So I haven't had much time to work on videos. Most of my effort went into making this one, and Tankfish of all people beat me to the punch. But I do honestly really recommend this game. I think it's very fun, and I think it's only gonna get better in the future. I plan on making more tutorials for it as far as building and maybe combat goes, so stay tuned for that if you like this game. Otherwise, thanks for watching this video guys, Skit Gaming signing out, goodbye.